the title of the next talk is longer than most of the abstracts that we had received for that workshop. I still try to uh, read it out for you. Finding an open least common denominator for life integration of non-space system standard components within constrained budgets. So, the next speaker is Rüdiger Gard. He is a project manager for research and development at Therma GmbH. Before that, he was a senior software engineer. Uh, he has uh, studied his master in Frankfurt, University of Applied Sciences. And he did a PhD at Universidad de Cadiz in Spain. So, his talk is about message-oriented middleware and how closure can be a beginning. Rudiger, it's yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? Is the microphone sitting well? Okay, good. Uh, sorry for the clumsy title. Uh, what I want to want you to take away of the title first is the last word, the last two words, constraint budgets. Uh, I had the feeling that many people have quite constraint budgets here. And uh, what's maybe a little bit particular in this, in the experience I'm going to report, is that we were integrating uh, non-space system standard components. Because I've seen lots of people talking about standards, and I've also spoke with a lot of some people already and uh, heard about the pain points regarding the standards, because the space standards are rather, let's say, heavyweight and uh, costly to implement. And we were essentially facing the same issues and uh, I'll just explain a bit about the experiences we made in uh, two projects for ESA. So um, the outline, first I'll give you a bit of an overview of the context, what I'm talking about. I'm not going into detail of the projects, but I hope enough to give you um, so that you see the context of the whole thing. I'll speak a, a little bit about runtime integration in the ground segment. Then, that's the main part, I'll talk about the choices we made and the experiences we made during that integration in these two projects. I'll summarize a bit on the message or in the middleware that we used, and yeah, I'll finish as usual with the conclusion. So, in the context, these are two ESA studies. Uh, one was about uh, virtual reality, the other one was about augmented reality, and the uh, scope was ESA operations in the ground systems. So, our um, job as a company was to help ESA identify opportunities for using and employing virtual reality, respectively augmented reality, in the ground segment. And so we had to deal with different software systems. So on one hand, we had the ESA software systems, classical mission control systems, simulators, which are very well established at the ESOC, where we did the study, and also the European Astronaut Center participated there. Uh, but we also had these third-party systems, virtual reality, augmented reality, and so on. And if you go outside of the space community and you tell them, hey, that's CCSDS or that's PUS or that's ESCC or whatsoever, they don't know anything about it. I mean, those, those standards are fairly, let's say, isolated in the space domain. So virtual reality, augmented reality, um, all these, we, we were used essentially off-the-shelf solutions that you can buy nowadays very inexpensively. And, well, we had a problem that we had to bring those two systems together within the constraint budget, of course. I mean, we could have tried to implement uh, the complex standards, but then most likely we were running out of budget already trying to implement the standard at all. So, this is just to give you a bit of the bigger picture of the overview for the virtual reality study. So, you see on the uh, top left there is a virtual reality that's typically, well, well we, we used, or our partner used their Unity, which uses C Sharp. It's run on a Windows desktop computer. Uh, on the lower left, you have SimSet, which is a simulation environment used at ESOC for operational simulators, for satellites, for training, and all these things. It's implemented in C++, typically uses Corva as, a, as communication uh, middleware, and it's typically running on Linux. We had on the, on the uh, lower right, we used uh, MOE as a mission control system. It's implemented in Java. It provides APIs for web services and to some degree using CCS DSMO, also typically, typically running on Linux. And on the top uh, right, we, have a, we also came up with a web-based prototype for virtual reality that's using then running in Firefox, using A-frame, JavaScript, and typically also run on Windows. And, uh, well, I marked sort of the barrier between the non-space systems and the space systems, and we sort of had to bridge, and you see we had to connect quite a number of systems uh, within a very limited budget. And um, 
Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'm not showing the augmented reality thing, but I'll get there as well. And yeah, that's what I'm showing you. So first of all, runtime integration. This is a very, very high level overview just to sort of get us all on the same page. I mean, we, many of us know the typical layered uh, models, OSI or TCP IP layered model whatsoever. I want to boil it down here onto two things that you need to have when you want to communicate. Let's say A wants to talk to B or transmit some data. So first of all, you need to have some communication infrastructure like sockets, RMI, CORBA, whatsoever. You need to have some way of talking to each other, let's say. And then you need to have some serialization and data representation. So you need to have some way of putting the data on the wire actually, so that all participants can understand that. Um, and of course there are certain aspects to this, there are certain trade-offs, so ease of use. In our case, of course, obviously ease of use was very important because we wanted to quickly get started, quickly get running, quickly get, get moving. So what are the available libraries? What's the boilerplate code? Do I have to do complicated connection setup, connection management, or even take the data transfer into account. Uh, what about code generation? I mentioned some of the systems use Corva, so of course there are some, let's say, interface definition languages you could, that require code generation upfront, or you could also use Google protocol buffers, which does something similar. Uh, what about the flexibility? You saw that we needed to grow the system step by step. How easy are changes? What about the performance? Okay, performance was not our key pressure point here, but still, I mean, it's worth to consider. And also, what, what are the platforms? This was actually something that was quite surprising for us. That's what we noticed when we moved from the virtual reality to the augmented reality study, that even though the systems look quite the same, there's quite a, bit, quite of a difference between the, the, the desktop on which the virtual reality runs versus the HoloLens on which the augmented reality runs. So, we started first um, in an iterative approach. First of all, we wanted to connect SIMSA to the virtual reality environment. And we, of course, we already took into account that we need to integrate all the other systems as well. So this may look like a very big uh, tool to use, but in, in, in the, that's what I want to convey. During the progress of the study and of the work, it really turned out, uh, turned out that this decision was very good to put a message-oriented middleware in the middle, have a fairly lightweight adapter here, and then, as you see already here, we, uh, between the virtual reality environment and the middleware, we use open wire as a wire format, between the adapter and the middleware, we use Stomp as a wire format. And this flexibility of using different wire formats in the same middleware uh, proved to be actually very uh, beneficial. And I'm stressing this a bit more as, as we move on. I'm not going to explain too much right now about the adapter and everything. If, you have, if you're interested in this, and I can answer this, I think, as part of the questions, but you, because of the limited time, I think I just move on. Because in the next step, we wanted to integrate a mission control system. And what we did again was we just implemented a simple adapter between the space system related standards to something that's fairly established in the computer science community. And this made it actually, well, what was straightforward. Also the adapter here is fairly lightweight. And in the last step you already see there is this web-based prototype. And again, as you could imagine, we just attached it and this time we used the third wire format. Actually this time we used something that's uh, communicating through web sockets so that we can send the data live into a web browser. So we have all these systems working very nicely with each other. And this is essentially the status at the end of the virtual reality study. And now comes the augmented reality study. And it looks pretty cool because, hey, the virtual reality and the augmented reality they, the systems, they look pretty much the same. It's Unity, it's C-sharp, it's, it's very fine. But I already mentioned there was this problem of the platform because uh, our partner implemented these parts up there. And uh, by moving from the desktop to the HoloLens, uh, unfortunately, they couldn't use the OpenWire library anymore because it wasn't available for HoloLens for whatever reason. So we were essentially stuck there and having all, essentially we could reuse everything we had, but we were stuck of connecting the whole uh, the, the thing because of the missing library. But fortunately enough, the message or in the middleware also supports another protocol, in this case MQTT, and this protocol was apparently easy to implement for the HoloLens as well. So there was no problem at all. So the only, only thing, only switch our partner had to do was essentially change the open wire library to the MQTT library and adjust a little bit of the, the boilerplate code there, which was very little. But the serialization and everything else could, could remain the same. And that's also one of the key messages I want to convey for the serialization here. It is very important that you go, very, go to a very basic type of data that you transmit. And what we choose here in the end was we use JSON as a format. We put it in a UTF-8 string and then chose, uh, got, got a byte array representation of that string. And this is 
so generic from what we experienced in this work is that, uh, well, you could use it everywhere, essentially. I mean, everyone know under, or most components under, or well, all components understand byte arrays. By now, by today, all, co all components should also understand UTF-8, and JSON libraries are actually fairly small and fairly flexible to use and fairly easily available. So, to summarize the choices here, the communication, as communication infrastructure, we used the message or the middleware with one central broker. We didn't have a requirement to scale the system, so this was actually a reasonable choice. We used four different protocols in the end, Stomp, OpenWire, uh, open no, StompWire WebSockets, and MQTT. And the middleware transparently bridges between these protocols, so there is no overhead on our, our side for implementation. Regarding the serialization already mentioned, we chose JSON, put it in the UTF-8 string, then used byte arrays. We didn't have any complex class hierarchies. We used generic data uh, structures like key value stores, sequences, and of course, uh, primitive types. That made it all quite simple to maintain and easy to implement. Um, uh, some words about the message-oriented middleware. Uh, we used a wrapper, some abstraction, it's called Boric. It's based on Apache ActiveMQ, Eclipse Paho, Spring Messaging, and sorts of all sorts of other libraries, such that all these multi-protocol um, middleware is easy to use. It's available under the Eclipse public license on GitHub. Here you see uh, some of the texts that well, are typically put for these open source projects, like the available version, it passes two different continuous integration systems, code coverage is about 91%. Um, the focus of Borerig is on the ease of use, as what I mentioned, on flexibility. Still, I mentioned performance. I just want to very briefly talk, say something about performance here. In the virtual reality study, study we transferred 75,000 parameters per second, which was more than enough in that context. There is another publication from 2015 in which we actually managed to send about 750 million bits per second through the, such a comparable uh, communication infrastructure. And as a conclusion, it's based on two studies. Our pain point was essentially the integration of non-space standard components. As a least common denominator, we found a message-oriented middleware with a, well, UTF-8 uh, JSON serialization. As a subjective evaluation, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the result. Essentially, the middleware, even though it looked quite complex in the pictures, it got very much out of the way. We could focus really on the core logic, on the integration part of the thing. And um, there are also other message-oriented middlewares in space systems. For example, CNES ISIS uses 0MQ. EGSCC uses Apache Service Mix, which also comes bundled with ActiveMQ. A GSOC is possibly going to use MQTT for some future systems. Um, yeah, and that's essentially what I wanted to convey to you. Um, there's my email address, there's a, the project, the open source project. Thank you very much. I hope I stayed within the given time frame and now I think it's open to questions. Okay, thank you, Rodiga. So, messaging systems. You're all messaging every day. Twitter, WhatsApp. Telegram. So, there are some questions. So, I wanted to ask about the applications of the VR and AR in the space um, sector. What, yes. what kind of applications are you looking for? Um, you mean what uh, applications are there for virtual reality and augmented reality? Yes. yes. Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, we had lots of interviews with uh, stakeholders from all different venues. We had participants from STEC, from the European Astronaut Center, from the European Space Operations Center. Um, well, it's, uh, let, me, let me maybe say something first. What I, my feeling is it's very difficult to get the users and the technologies together. Because the, uh, my experience was there are some sort of, let's say, rather abstract or foggy ideas, uh, but then you have to also look into the actual benefit and the actual utility. Uh, one thing you could also ima you could imagine, for example, for, vir for virtual reality, and I think NASA is doing this to some degree, I don't know how far they are there actually nowadays, um, but uh, you could, for example, use virtual reality for planning the operation of a rover. So you have a rover on a planet, you, if you have the rover there, you could use some LiDAR or whatever to scan the environment next to the rover. And once you have the 3D data and the 3D map, you could actually go there virtually, I mean with virtual reality. Uh, in the sense that um, 
for example, a scientist could mark positions of interest in a virtual, uh, virtual reality environment. Uh, operators could go there and assist the scientists in finding the best route to the points of interest and so, and so on. That, I think, was a very compelling uh, situation. Another in, in scenario we had is that it was also the proof of concept we implemented actually for the virtual reality study was that we um, implemented a simulation of a virtual lunar base. So, and in this, in this virtual lunar base, astronauts could already exercise uh, emergency situations like a, a fire or something like that. Um, but there are, all, there are lots of other ideas. If you're interested, you can try to, con or, well, you can contact me and I can forward your request then to the corresponding technical officer because all the documents should be available within ESA. I, I, I don't think there's any, any disclosure or whatever. You just need to know who to, uh, whom to ask and what to request and uh, I can, I, I would like to help you there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so, um, not being an, an expert in the o OSI layer architecture, I was wondering, so yesterday we heard about the message abstraction layer. Exactly. Um, and I wonder how does this uh, Bowerick middleware actually stand with respect to this message abstraction layer that we heard about yesterday? Yes. Um, actually, it could be used, uh, in my opinion, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to get that far yet uh, because of the usual time constraints and whatever. <laughs> I mean, we are, I, I think every one of us is, is rather busy, but uh, that's, that's ex exactly that's a, that's a good point because it would be very good. I mean, you could use these message or middlewares, for example, as a, as a transport mechanism on, on which of top then the message, message, message abstraction layer sits <coughs> because, for example, with this message or middleware here, you get the publish subscribe pattern for free. Uh, there are also other middlewares that also would then have a re request reply uh, uh, p pattern and also, of course, the single patterns, just sending something and receiving. I mean, it's quite easily to implement. Um, and I think it would be, would be good to use such established middlewares as a, let's say, a transport vehicle because implementing something like that manually on, on top of TCP IP, when you do the mull, then you end up implementing a broker on your own again. And implementing a broker is something, I mean, there are so many brokers out there. You've seen this here. We already used four wire protocols, which are supported by the same broker. There are maybe 10 different implementations just from the top of my head and most likely even more. So, yeah. Some more questions? Feedback? No? Okay. In that case, I think uh, we stop for now. Thank you, Rudiger. Thank you. And uh, I, I heard that uh, this morning there was no coffee served. So that's a no-go, yeah? You have to get your coffee. So what we do is we have another presentation, but we're agile, not only in software, also in workshops. And Michelle has uh, agreed to have the talk after the coffee break, which is taking place now. Please get a coffee. <laughs>